Hey, this is Mrs. Williams, and I'm reading Day 2 of Masterpiece by Elise Broach. Starting in Chapter 3, The Birthday Party. The next day was Sunday, James's birthday. There was to be a party, a large one, and the Pompadays dining room was festooned with streamers and balloons. As Marvin and his parents foraged for breakfast under the kitchen table, they listened to the plans. I don't want these boys eating in the living room, Mrs. Pompadet told James. Make sure they stay at the table when it's time for cake. But Mom, James said, I can't tell them what to do. They're not even my friends. William banged def deafeningly on his high chair tray with a spoon and crowed at James. Yeah, 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 yeah. From what Marvin could tell, this was the word for James in William's very limited but forceful language. What a big boy you are, Mrs. Pomaday crew, wiping the baby's face with a washcloth. She turned to James. What do you mean they're not your friends? Why, the Fentons live right upstairs. You see Max every day. James sighed. They're very important clients of mine, the Fentons. I've got several referrals from them, and you know that's the heart of my business, word of mouth. Below the table, Mama and Papa looked at each other and rolled their eyes. So I hope you'll treat Max nicely, dear, Mrs. Pomaday continued. Mama shook her head, whispering, clients. Will he have a single one of his own friends at the party, she asked. Of course not, Papa replied. Marvin had seen enough of Pompadé's parties to know that his parents were right. Whatever the occasion, the guest list was always as a loose assemblage of people she worked with or wanted to work with. And... For the entire party, Mrs. Pompadet would float fawningly from one person to the next, confiding self-important tips about the Manhattan real estate market. Mrs. Pompadet plucked William from the high chair and said encouragingly, We're having a magician, remember? You know how you love magic, James. James hesitated. Mom, don't you think that's the kind of thing people have at a little kid's party? Nonsense, dear. Everyone loves magicians. They're like clowns. Marvin personally hated clowns, which he had seen in abundance on t television because Mr. Pompadet had an odd fascination with the circus. Clowns struck Marvin as scary and untrustworthy, with their painted faces and exaggerated expressions always trying to get strangers to laugh. The Beatles had learned most of what they knew about the outside world from the Pompadet's endless stream of television shows. Mrs. Pompadet's favorite were hospital dramas or soap operas, while Mr. Pompadet preferred long documentaries on obscure subjects. James liked cartoons, which Marvin found colorful and quite satisfying, especially when they featured a heroic or particularly energetic inner insect. The best thing about television in the Pompadet's household was that the Pompadets tended to snack while they watched their shows so the Beatles could count on a veritable smorgasbord of popcorn kernels, raisins, potato ch and potato chip crumbs at the end of the evening. Marvin watched James, who was jiggling a sneaker. Mom, James said, do you think Dad will come? I don't know, James. He said he'd try, but it's going to be a wonderful party. You'll see. Mrs. Pompadet swept over and kissed the top of his head. Stop moping. It's your birthday. Come help me with the goodie bags. James's father was an artist, the maker of large abstract paintings, one of which, a mostly blue canvas called Horse, hung above the couch in the living room. It was a constant source of tension between Mrs. Pompadet and her second husband. I don't see why I have to look at that every night, Mr. Pompadet would complain. It doesn't look anything like a horse. It doesn't even look like an animal. James could have painted that. Mrs. Pompadet's answer is always the same. Oh, stop. It goes with the rug. Do you know how hard it is to match an oriental? Marvin secretly admired the painting very much. He sometimes climbed all the way up to the brass floor lamp for a better view of the bold streak, bold blue streak at its center. While the painting didn't look like a horse, it felt like a horse fast and graceful and free. What can we give James for his birthday? He asked his parents as they 
lug two cereal flakes and crumbs of buttered toast back to the cupboard. It has to be something great. Look in the treasure box, Mama said. I'm sure you'll find the perfect thing. The treasure box was an open velvet earring case that had been very difficult indeed to push and tug into the beetle's home. It was filled with all kinds of tiny things humans tended to drop or misplace, items that rolled under furniture or caught in the cracks between the floorboards, or as William became more dexterous, the things he enjoyed sticking through the grates of the heating vents. Right now, the treasure box contained a few paper clips, two coins, a button, the gold clasp from a necklace, the slender silver bar that once held a watch strap in place, a small eraser, a pen cap, and the most prized possession of all, a single pearl earring. The Beatles happened to know that pearl earrings found in the wreckage of the Papaday's annual holiday party belonged to a favorite client of Mrs. Papaday's, who had called the next day in a tizzy over its loss. Generally, Mama felt strongly that particularly valuable items should be returned to their human owners, which just meant that the Beatles carried them to some obvious spot in the house and left them in full view where they would inevitably be discovered and exclaimed over in relief. However, in this case, Mr. and Mrs. Pompadour had been so unpleasant to James in the wake of the party, berating him for a china plate that he accidentally dropped when his mother asked him to clear the dishes, that the Beatles were not inclined to return the pearl earring. I don't think there's anything good for James in the treasure box, Marvin said worriedly. None of that stuff is his. Does he have any electronics in need of repair? Mama asked. Clock radio? Boombox? I'm sure Albert would be happy to tinker with something for him. Uncle Albert had trained as an electrician a particularly useful skill in the Papa Day's aging apartment. He had been known to fix the faulty wiring on their, in their thermostat on more than one occasion, though he sometimes raised the apartment's heat to insufferable levels in the process. Tricky business, thermostats, he always said. No, I don't think so, Marvin answered. I haven't heard him complaining about anything, although he realized James wasn't really the type to complain. What about the coins in the treasure box, Papa suggests. I think there's a buffalo nickel. Marvin thought about that. Would James even notice that it was a special nickel? Probably. James was the type to notice things. Maybe, he said, if we can't find anything better. The party was a boisterous disaster. Mr. Pompadour was dispatched to the park with William, while 11 energetic boys, none of whom paid any particular attention to James, raced through the apartment. They dumped elaborately wrapped presents on the sideboard and then stampeded from room to room, whooping loudly. They broke a doorknob, or they broke a knob off the stereo. They spilled soda in the dining room rug, they locked a small, nervous boy named Simon in James's closet without anyone realizing that he was missing. When the magician arrived, they gleefully tormented him, yelling out spoilers. It's in the other hand. I saw it. As he performed his tricks, one boy dug around in the leather bag of props when the magician wasn't watching and triumphantly brandished a set of handcuffs. Let's play jail. Marvin watched the whole affair from a safe vantage point behind the skirt of the living room couch. Sneakers pounding past him, squeaking on the wood floors. He kept rarely out of sight, heeding Mama's warning. Whatever you do, darling, don't let them see you. These are the kinds of boys who will pull the legs off a beetle just for the fun of it. It was an oft-repeat adage among the beetles that human parties were no place for their kind. Marvin remembered all too clearly the fate of his grandfather, who had been crushed by a stiletto heel while pursuing a bacon bit during the Pompadour's Meet the Neighbors party. From behind the skirting, Marvin could see James sitting quietly on the sideline. Mrs. Pompadour kept prompting, prompting him in exasperation. James, don't just sit there like that. Show the boys your new computer. James, thank Henry for the this lovely red sweater. It will be perfect for Valentine's Day. James, tell Max about the wonderful time we had skating last week. 
at the Rockefeller Center rink, Max? We love to go there on weekend afternoons when there aren't so many tourists. We'll bring you along the next time, shall we? From a past conversation, Marvin knew that the Pompadays had been to the rink exactly once, that Mrs. Pompadae had dropped James off while she went across the street to Saks to buy a wedding present, and that James, who didn't know how to skate, had spent the hour clinging to the side wall instead unsteadily making his way around the circle while more experienced skaters zipped past. The doorbell rang and Mrs. Pompadae clapped her hands, smiling brightly. Oh, look at the time. Your parents are here, boys. She herded them towards the entryway. Come get your goodie bags. James, dear, stand by the door and hand them out. Marvin, risking exposure, darted along the baseboard to the marble-floored foyer. When Mrs. Pompadae opened the door, however, it wasn't the hoped-for cavalcade of parents. It was Carl Tarek, James's father. Mrs. Pompadae ste stepped back in disappointment. Oh, she said, Carl. The other boys thundered away in indifference. James's whole face lit up. Dad, you came. James's father was a big man with longish brown hair and a messy, scruffy beard. He had a warm, gentle smile that Marvin liked because it spread across his face slow, so slowly that it had to be real. Hey, buddy, he said to James. Of course I came. It's your birthday. He grabbed James by the shoulder and wrapped him in a hug. You can come in for a minute, Mrs. Pompadae said crisply, crisply, but the boys are about to pick up, and I need James to hand out the goodie bags while I speak to their parents. Cutting deals? Carl asked, still smiling. No, no, Mrs. Pompadae said dismissively, then added in a lower voice. But you'll see that Meredith Steinberg's son is here, and they're in the market for a classic six, so it certainly wouldn't hurt for me to say a few words to her. Marvin had often wondered how someone like Carl Tarek could have ever been married to Mrs. Pompadae. They seemed profoundly different. He'd overheard James ask his father a similar question once, hesitantly, as if he wasn't quite sure he wanted to hear the answer. Carl had simply said, your mother has excellent taste. She always did from the day I met her. An eye for beauty is a rare thing. Good taste to Marvin didn't seem like much of a foundation for love. Then again, it had turned out not to be. Carl was ruffling James's hair with one hand. I brought you something, he said, setting, up a, crump setting a crumpled plastic shopping bag on the hallway table. Marvin edged away from the baseboard, trying to see. What was it? What would James want it to be? James grinned at his father and reached inside. He drew out a small, navy blue box, which he opened carefully. Oh, he said. Marvin climbed quickly up one of the slippery, polished table legs to have a look. The box contained a squat glass bottle filled with dark liquid. It's ink said Carl. James said nothing, turned it over in his hand. Marvin could tell he was disappointed. It's pen. It's a pen and ink set for drawing. Carl rustled the bag and pulled out a flat black case. Here's the pen. Look, your initials, so everyone will know it's yours. Marvin can see that there were three crisp gold letters on the top. And I got you a pad of paper, too. Carl added. James tilted the bottle of ink, watching the liquid shift inside, catching the light. Cool, he said, looked up at his father. Thanks, Dad. It's really cool. Is that permanent ink, Mrs. Pompadae demanded? Does it stain? Well, yes. That's what you use, a pen, use for pen and ink drawings. Mrs. Pompadae sighed. It had better stay in your room, James, on your desk. I don't want ink splattering all over the house. She looked, shook her head. Really, Carl? That doesn't seem very appropriate for a gift for an 11-year-old. Carl shifted uncomfortably. He'll be careful with it. You know that. James is careful with everything. Mrs. Pompadae snorted. It will be fun for him to experiment, Carl said, looping one arm over James's narrow shoulders and pulling him close. Look at the pen, buddy. James lifted the pen and unscrewed the cap. 
Marvin could see that the pen was slim and elegant, with a delicate silver nib. Wow, James said, clearly trying to muster some enthusiasm. This is how you fill it, Carl said, demonstrating. Watch the position of your hand while you're drawing so you don't smear the ink. It will take a while to get the hang of it. The doorbell rang again. Oh, here they are, Mrs. Poppadake cried. Boys, James, hurry, the goodie bags. She nudged Carl towards the door. You can show all of this to him tomorrow when he's with you, she said. You'll pick him up at noon? Yeah, or a little after. That okay, James? James looked from his father to his mother and nodded quickly. Sure, Dad. Mrs. Pompadour pursued her lips, sweeping past, or pursed her lips, sweeping past him. Well, I'd like to know what time to expect you. We have plans tomorrow afternoon. If you're going to cancel like last time, you need to at least call. It isn't fair to James, and it certainly isn't fair to me. I have a life, too, you know. Sorry about that, Carl said sheepish, sheepishly. Stuff comes up, that's all. Mrs. Pompadour swung the door open and smiled broadly. Julie, we've had the most wonderful time. We didn't even notice it was so late. You're going to have trouble dragging Ryan away. Oh, this is Jane's father, Carl Tarek. Yeah, that's right, the artist. He's just leaving.